I'm gonna go ahead and get started and I'm gonna clear out some of these things and just kind of move some things around here so that I can get started. I wanna start with camellias. Um, you know, camellias are one of the most popular shrubs in this area. Um, it's a kind of a southern favorite and camellias are absolutely gorgeous and there's a lot of different varieties of them. Right now, they're all 40% off. Uh, camellias are great. There's fall bloomers and spring bloomer camellias. So that's kind of how I've always said them. If you want to get kind of specific, the spring blooming camellias are Camellia japonica. The fall blooming camellias are Camellia sisenqua. So if you're ever kind of looking and you're kind of curious, the tags should tell you the information. Another great thing about Monrovia is their tags have amazing information in them. Um, but if you ever see the Latin name, Camellia sisenqua means it's a fall bloomer. Those are going to bloom typically in the, uh, I would say, October, November, December time frame. And then your spring bloomer uh, camellias, the Camellia japonicas, uh, they will bloom in the spring. And they can start as early as February um, and bloom all the way till April, depending on different plants. So there's early spring bloomers, there's mid spring bloomers, and there's late spring bloomers. I kind of always feel like they all seem to kind of bloom around the same time. Um, but you can definitely read all the labels and there are tons of varieties. I couldn't go through, I mean, I could do a whole webinar on just camellias, uh, but this one is gorgeous. This one is called Kramer Supreme, I believe. So Kramer Supreme is this really pretty red. I brought this one in because it's one of the ones that is blooming probably the most prolifically right now. And you can really see that really pretty bloom on there. There's lots of different styles of blooms on the spring bloomers. So let me tell you kind of the difference between the spring and the fall bloomers. Fall bloomers have tons of flowers and they're small little flowers. Um, and they're usually kind of semi-double to, to single flowers. And what I mean by that is the petal count. So one of the most popular fall blooming camellias is the Yuletide camellia. It's a red flower with a yellow center. It looks like kind of the Christmas bloom, I think. Um, and it's a single bloom. Now there's also the Autumn Rocket, which is another one of our favorites. Um, and it has a white flower that's double to semi-double. Um, so it's a little bit higher petal count. So it's double the amount of petals, which is why they call it a double or semi-double. Um, most of the spring blooming camellias have huge flowers. I mean, look at the size of these buds on here. I mean, these things are huge. This is the size of a walnut almost. I mean, so you got these huge buds on here. You can see them as they start to get bigger and bigger. And then these flowers just by themselves are absolutely stunning. Um, Kramer Supreme is what I would call kind of a peony style bloom. So peonies are gonna have kind of that peony look, hence the name. Um, so they're kind of crinkled petals all kind of crammed in there. I mean, tons and tons of petals. You'll get some formals, some formal doubles. Um, you'll get some singles even in the spring blooming camellias. Um, there's lots and lots of different styles of blooms. There's one that'll fit your need. They all have a huge range of colors as well. White to multicolored, meaning kind of red and white or pink mixed in. Uh, there's white, pink, red, and then kind of the multicolors. Um, and so there's lots and lots of different varieties. There's too many to even talk about. I would say there's probably somewhere in the 6,000 range of, of different varieties and different bloom colors, um, but they're so much fun to grow. Now, fall, spring blooming camellias are what you're gonna see right now. All of the camellias, I believe, let me just check. Yep, all of our camellias right now are 40% off. It's a great deal. Um, so you can come in and check out. The fall bloomers are not blooming as much, uh, but they're good plants. And the other big difference with fall bloomers and spring bloomers is the spring blooming camellias, I really feel like, do the best in a little bit of shade. Now, I've seen some growing in full sun, um, and I'm not gonna say that it's, that it's unfeasible, that you couldn't do it, uh, but I really feel like spring blooming camellias are gonna like a little bit of shade. So think about their natural habitat where they would naturally grow is underneath pine trees. That's kind of where they love to be. Um, you can grow them in other wooded areas with oak trees and maples and different things. Uh, but they really, really uh, prefer a little bit of shade. Now the fall blooming camellias can take full sun. So they're a little bit more versatile. They can take sun to shade. So think about areas in your yard where you might want to use these. These are great specimen plants. Uh, so you can grow just one single plant and they're absolutely stunning. Most of your spring blooming camellias are going to get around the 8 to 10 foot high range and about 4 to 6 feet wide. So a good size shrub, you can keep them trimmed and they're not real fast growing, so you don't have to worry. I say eight to 10 feet. Whenever we give sizes in shrubs, uh, we're typically talking about a 10, maybe even 15 year estimated size. Um, and that's what's so cool about shrubs is they give you tons of value. They get many, many years out of them um, and they can grow for a very long time. Uh, you know, very, very old. I mean, you think about Colonial Williamsburgs and the boxwoods there that have been there for three, 400 years. 
Um, so these shrubs can last a long time. And that's why I think it's one of the most valuable things uh, that you can put into your landscape is shrubs because they're kind of the staple. They're the bones of, of your landscape design. But camellias are gorgeous. You can grow them as a single specimen plant. You can grow them as a hedge. Um, you can grow them in groupings. I really love to see a grouping of them. Uh, and they just look great in a woodland setting, but they grow well on a north side of a house to an east side of the house. West and south sides of your home are gonna get more sun than probably this camellia is gonna like. Uh, so a little bit of shade, give it some room to grow. Uh, they can get pretty good size. They're not super, super fast growing, but they don't have a lot of issues either. They've got this really thick waxy leaf so you can see this really thick waxy leaf. So they typically don't have a lot of issues. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of winter burn when we get a really, really cold winter. Um, and you might get some marbling in the leaves and stuff like that, but that's easy to take care of. Sometimes they'll bloom a little bit early and then we'll get a frost and it'll kind of fry some of those blooms off. That's okay, it's not gonna hurt the plant. Uh, it's just part of the, 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 the nature of, of when these plants bloom in this area. Um, in the, uh, garden center if you come in to check out these camellias you're going to start to see them opening up real soon i've got a couple other varieties here so there aren't a ton blooming right now there's a ton that have buds on it so this is a really pretty one this one's called lemon glow you can't probably quite see it with the uh, glare coming off the lights uh, but it's it's a white bloom but it's got kind of a lemony yellow kind of tint to it so it's really really pretty it's actually got a little fragrance to it. Most camellias aren't real fragrant. Uh, they're more grown for just the blooms and the different sizes, but this would be kind of considered a formal double. So lots and lots of petals, really, really pretty. Um, but this is Lemon Glow, and this one's got lots and lots of little buds on it popping out, and you're gonna see more and more of these popping out around the garden center, so it's a great time to come in and check them out. In your landscape right now, you're probably not going to see a ton of them blooming quite yet. You might see some starting here pretty soon, um, but typically in the landscape, uh, they're going to be a little bit further behind than a, in a container plant. So if you're growing camellias in a pot, you might see them bloom a little bit earlier, and that's because the soil is going to warm up faster than our ground soil. So usually things that you find in a pot, like a lot of times people come in to pick out a cherry tree when they see the cherry trees blooming in the area. Well, when they come in, the cherry trees are usually done and that's because they're grown in a container and they're going to bloom a little bit earlier. So uh, sometimes when you come in the garden center and you'll see a cherry tree blooming, they're not going to be blooming in your landscape quite yet or around the area because the soil temperature just hasn't warmed up quite yet. This is another one of my favorite camellias. This one's called Les Marberry. So I don't know if you can see that tag, but you can see a red bloom and a white bloom and that white bloom actually has some marbling on it. And this one I picked out you can actually, if you can quite see in there, but it's got stripes all in there. So it's really a formal bloom. It's got tons of petals. It's got a candy cane kind of stripe in there. So you got white bloom with all these red markings in it. Uh, so it comes out kind of looking pink, but it is really pretty and see that tag. Let's see if I can get that tag close enough for you to see. I don't know if you can quite see it, but you've got to check this one out. Les Marberry is one of my favorites. You can get red blooms to white blooms to a marbling in between. So just on one plant, you can have multiple looking little blooms on it. Really, really pretty one. And then let's see, I grabbed one more. This is the other one I grabbed. This one is called Man Size. So this is Man Size. Man Size is kind of that peony style bloom as well. I don't know if you can quite see that one, just started opening. We've got another one coming on this side. Um, but this is a really pretty white bloom. It's got kind of a uh, single petal count on the outside, and then it's got kind of a peony crinkle inside. So really, really pretty. Lots and lots of different colors out there. Camellias are awesome. So let's see. Uh, let's see. I've got some questions here. Going to need a few Kramer camellias. Well, come on in. Check them out. They're 40% off. Great deal on all of them. Um, let's see. Crystal said, lilac is my favorite. Denise is in the corner with filtered sun. That's good. That's what they like. Can a camellia be planted in mostly sun? Um, and then let's see, we've got a couple questions here. My camellia has taken forever to bloom, but it is blooming right now have had it for probably five to six years. And Denise, yes, they can bloom a little bit earlier. There are some early bloomers, um, and especially when, when you see we get these warm days, they're gonna start blooming pretty quickly. Can a camellia be planted in mostly sun? So Crystal, to answer your question, I would say uh, 
check out the fall blooming camellias, they definitely can take full sun. Spring blooming camellias really prefer a little bit of shade. However, I'm not saying that it can't be done. If you've got your heart set on it, what you need to do is just look at the sun. If it's all day, you know, blaring sun, it might struggle some. You might see some disease or fungus issues uh, because it's dealing with those things. Uh, so typically I would say plant in a little bit of shade. If you really want to try it, we can kind of help you by giving you some preventative uh, insecticides and fungicides because a stressed out plant is going to be more susceptible to some of those issues. We also probably would want to mulch it. Uh, make sure we're keeping mulch around the root system of that plant uh, so that it can stay kind of hydrated during those hotter summer days. But Crystal, if you can or if you want to, come and check us out. And I would, I would recommend looking at the fall blooming camellias because I think they'll do a little bit better in full sun. And maybe we'll talk about some other plants here that uh, will pique your interest and that you can grow in full sun. All right, so Crystal says, okay, nested with a tree it is. Didn't realize I had options for fall and spring. That's awesome. Yep, so fall bloomers would be great choice. Um, I have a camellia that is at least 20 years old. It's in the shade and it blooms twice a year. It's on the northeast of the house. Perfect spot. Karen, it sounds like it's doing really, really, really well, so that's awesome to hear. My favorite is the Encore azaleas and rhododendron. How long do azaleas usually live? All right, so that's my next plant. So we'll get into the azaleas. Uh, so I'm gonna move this camellia off to the side. Let's see if I can. All right, so the next plant is azaleas. And azaleas, there are a ton of different types of azaleas out there. And azaleas are one of my favorite shrubs. Uh, again, likes a little bit of shade. I prefer them in a little bit of shade. I've seen them growing in full sun. And again, you can attempt it in full sun. You definitely wanna keep them mulched and keep them well hydrated during the first couple summers just to make sure that they make it through. But this is the Encore Azalea. So Encore Azaleas come in these pots. Encore Azaleas are awesome. Uh, it's kind of becoming, uh, for sure, kind of the most sought after uh, azaleas out there. Spring blooming azaleas only. Uh, the, the basic, you know, azaleas like your Coral Bells, Delaware Valley White, uh, Hershey Red, those are kind of things that, I mean, we still carry them and they're definitely great azaleas, um, but they only bloom in the spring. So why not get an Encore azalea? And these have been hybridized to bloom in the spring and fall. So you get twice the amount of blooms, plus they typically will sporadically bloom throughout the summer. Now, they don't put quite the show on that a spring blooming camellia, a, a normal, just sorry, azalea, a normal azalea would bloom in the spring only and they get completely covered in blooms. Encore azaleas don't typically get that full coverage of blooms, but they have a lot of them and they're pretty. I mean, look at this one. This one is called Autumn Fire. Autumn Fire is a really pretty red color. You can see kind of how pretty that is and you get these big clusters of blooms all over it. It's a really easy shrub to grow, likes a little bit of shade and Encore azaleas come in lots and lots of different sizes as well. So let's see, I got another one right here. This one is also the Autumn Fire. And so you can see that foliage color. I wanted to bring this one in so you can see the difference in the foliage color. So this one's got green leaves. This one's got kind of that burgundy leaf. And so Encore azaleas will change their leaf colors. Actually, all azaleas really do uh, change their leaf color depending on the bloom color. So in the winter, it's really a four season interest plant. So spring, you get blooms. Summer, you'll get sporadic blooms, lots of new leaves. So it's a really pretty green color and uh, some sporadic blooms here and there. And then in the fall, you'll get a whole nother set of blooms as well. And then in the winter, your shrub will actually change a little bit of color in the leaf. And the pink, the dark pink, the reds, they will turn to a maroon color, the shrub. And then the whites and the lighter pinks might turn to a little bit of a kind of a golden color. So it's really, really pretty. So if you've got azaleas in your yard and you're kind of wondering, why are my leaves changing color? It's because that's what they do. And that, in fact, all azaleas really kind of do it. Some do it more pronounced than others. Some might not change much at all, depending on the conditions, um, but really pretty fall, winter color as well. So that's why I really like these Encore azaleas. So you get multiple blooms. They get lots of different sizes too. So this one, Autumn Fire, only gets about two by two. So it's a nice small shrub. You could use it as a foundation shrub. Uh, if your house faces east or north, I uh, would love that. West and south sides of homes are gonna get a little bit more sun, obviously, and so therefore, you probably wanna wanna make sure they're protected. They grow great under trees, uh, so in wooded areas, that they work great under small trees, even like a Japanese maple. They would grow great underneath that, something that's gonna give it a little bit of protection during those hot summer months. Uh, when the leaves fall off in the winter, that is completely fine. 
the shrubs will take uh, a little bit more sun during that period. It won't hurt them at all. Uh, so Encore Azaleas, there's a lot of different colors. There's whites, purples, pinks. Uh, and different variations within all of those. And then there's lots of different sizes too. So I mentioned the Autumn Fire gets about two by two. There's some like Autumn Twist that get five to six feet high and wide. And right now the Encore Azaleas are 30% off. So you get a great deal. Uh, this is the one gallon size, $24.99, and they're 30% off. And then also, see I just wanna make sure that's correct. So sorry, it's just the three gallon Encore Azaleas that are 30% off. Uh, so this one is the three gallon. So much larger plant, and they're $44.99, but they're 30% off. Huge collection of them right now. You definitely want to check those out. Uh, there's lots and lots of different azaleas out there. Um, let's see, so Air, uh, Ina said, do you have yellow Encore azaleas? Uh, what color do they turn in the winter? Would they work in full sun? So yes, you can grow Encore azaleas. If I were ever to grow any azalea in full sun, I would probably choose the Encore. It's probably one of the hardiest for a full sun area. Just watch it and protect it a little bit. And what I mean by that is make sure it's got mulch around it. That'll keep the root system kind of cool in the summer heat. Uh, I prefer them in a little bit of shade. I feel like they do better. So if you've got a little bit of a shadier spot for them, they would do great. The next plant I'm gonna talk about actually works better in full sun is kind of the full sun azalea. So maybe that one might work for you. Um, and then I think your other question was, is there yellow? So there's no yellow in the Encore azaleas. Um, there are whites. So there's an Autumn Angel that's a white, and I think there's Autumn Moonlight, uh, which is also a white. Um, so there are multiple colors. Usually they come in whites, pinks, different ranges of pinks from light pink to dark pink, reds, lots of different colors in reds too, like this really fiery red, but also uh, kind of an orangey red as well, um, and then even into the purples. And some of them, like the Twist, have uh, purple with white kind of markings on them. So kind of a multicolored bloom, but no yellow. So sorry, you know, there's no yellow blooms on the Encore azaleas. Um, and most azaleas kind of stay in that range of colors. Um, so the other azalea that I want to show real quick, uh, let's see, where is it? Is this one is called Golden Flare. So to answer your question, there is yellow azaleas. They are not encore, so they won't bloom in the uh, spring and fall. They just bloom in the spring and they're deciduous. So there are lots and lots of different azaleas. They're actually part of the rhododendron family. As I, somebody mentioned earlier, Deborah mentioned uh, encore azaleas and rhododendrons are her favorite. Uh, rhododendrons are gorgeous plants. Uh, they're a little bit more finicky. They got the waxy, big waxy leaf. Uh, they want to be planted a little bit high. They don't like a lot of moisture. They get root rot issues sometimes. So be careful when you're planting those. We got a small selection in now. I didn't bring them in uh, to show because I just have a small selection right now. But these are deciduous azaleas, and these are absolutely stunning. They come in oranges and yellows. So this one's called Golden Flare. I don't know if you can quite see that tag, but it's kind of an orange to yellow colored bloom. Really unusual, really different. When these bloom, uh, they are absolutely stunning. And when they bloom, they fly out of here too. So that's kind of why I wanted to bring them in and show them to you because if you ever wanted a deciduous azalea, now is a great time to come and get them because this is really the only time of the year that we really carry them. We might get some sporadically through the year, but if you've ever wanted one and you feel like you keep missing it because every year you see them blooming and you come in and they're gone, um, come in now. It's a great time to come in and get these deciduous azaleas. There's lots of different colors that range from orange to yellow. So this is a really, really pretty one. So I wanted to kind of show you that because Azaleas come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. Um, some that are evergreen, like your Encore azaleas, and some that are deciduous that lose their leaves. So a really, really cool group of plants. Azaleas, Encore azaleas, the three gallons are 30% off right now. You gotta come in and check these out. They're one of my favorites. They work great for mass plantings, uh, borders, um, foundation plants, really, really easy uh, azalea to grow is the Encore azalea, one of my favorites. So come in and check those out. All right, let's see if there are any other questions. Um, I have had bushes 20 years old. Yep, they can last for a long time. So pretty much all these shrubs can last, I mean, 30, 40, 50 years. Typically in the landscape world, uh, when we're talking about kind of refreshing our landscape, I like to say a good landscape needs a good refreshing every 25 years. Uh, so that means you can get most of these plants are gonna give you 20, 25 years. Some of them, even when they get older and bigger, you can cut them down and they'll kind of refresh. It might take a couple years, but so, I know people that have had azaleas for 20, 50 years. Um, and every once in a while, you might have to give it a good prune, give it a little dose of fertilizer, maybe give it some super thrive to kind of get it going again, uh, but they can reflush and look absolutely stunning. 
Uh, so that's why I love shrubs. That's kind of my bread and butter because uh, they give you so much value and they just keep on performing for you year after year after year. So on Corzaeus, that's uh, the uh, one that I just showed you. So now I'm going to move to a little bit of a full sun plant. As I mentioned, I wanted to go to the Indian hawthorn. So this is Raphiolippus. So don't worry about that term. That's, that's a term that uh, is the, the Latin name, Raphiolippus. Uh, but I like to use just Indian hawthorn. I've got two great examples of them right here. So this is the pink variety. This one's called dwarf pink Indian hawthorn. You can see kind of, I don't know if you can quite see, but they're just starting to crack blooms right here. Little soft pink blooms. So remember I, when I mentioned a full sun azalea? That's what I classify this. So if you've ever really wanted to grow azaleas, but maybe you didn't have quite the right sun, uh, maybe you've got too much sun, Indian hawthorn kind of, I think, have a very similar characteristic to the azaleas. They're evergreen. They have green leaves year round. They get blooms in the spring. They don't bloom in the fall like the encore azaleas, but they bloom in the spring. And typically they'll get some berries in the fall. So like this pink one should get kind of bluish to black berries which is really kind of cool and the birds like to eat them. Uh, but Indian hawthorn is a great, super drought tolerant, very easy shrub to grow. This dwarf pink one gets about three by three. They look great in masses, borders, uh, for uh, uh, foundation plantings. They are awesome. A nice little three by three shrub has a nice kind of dome shape as well. So it doesn't get quite um, as, as uh, boxy as some shrubs might get. It has kind of just, think of like the super dome, you know, just that nice dome shape. Uh, really easy. You don't have to do a lot of pruning on it because they naturally grow into that shape. Uh, so they make a nice little rolling kind of low hedge or border, um, but also great foundation plant. Awesome, awesome plant. This is the dwarf pink, very drought tolerant, loves full sun. Then the other one is this really pretty one. This one is called the snowcap Indian hawthorn. And I'm showing it to you this way because you can see all that burgundy color. So that's actually what happens on some of the new growth, but also the winter color. So what's really cool about the snowcap Indian hawthorn is it gets white blooms. It's about the same size, three by three, um, and um, it kind of grows in that dome shape, but the winter color is absolutely amazing. Uh, so it turns this burgundy color all over the entire shrub in full sun in the winter. So it gives you, again, more winter interest, which is great. So snow cap is the white bloom, dwarf pink is the pink bloom. This one typically stays green year round. You don't get a lot of leaf color change in the winter, but the snow cap does and it's a really, really pretty one. And these are super drought tolerant. Now, the only issue that I personally have <laughs> with Indian hawthorn is I can't grow them because I have deer. They are like deer candy. So if you live where deer are a major problem, Indian hawthorn, unfortunately, aren't probably gonna work for you. We do have some systemic repellents that now work really, really well, but um, they I don't know that they would work on Indian hawthorn. It is really like deer candy, but if you don't have deer, it's a great plant. Uh, they can take a little bit of salt spray, so if you live closer to the waterfront, uh, they'll be perfectly fine in that area. Super drought tolerant, very easy shrub to grow, and they're all 30% off right now, so you can't beat that deal. The dwarf pink, really, really pretty, and the snow cap, those are my two favorites. There's another one called dwarf yeda, um, and that one gets a little bit taller. That one gets about five to six feet high and wide. So if you're looking for kind of a smaller hedge, uh, that might be a good option. You know, it gets right around that fence height, the five to six foot high range, which is kind of a, a different size that you don't get a lot in the landscape. So Dwarf Yeda is another one that we do carry. Uh, let's see, so uh, Karen said, how big? Three by three. And then how much are they? So that's a good question. I didn't mention the price. The Dwarf Pink is $49.99, but 30% off of that. And this one might not have a tag on it, I think I lost the tag on this guy. But I think the snow caps are right around that same range, $44.99 to $49.99. So somewhere in that range and 30% off right now. So great deals. One of my favorite go-to shrubs. I mean, just super, super easy to grow. Not a lot of maintenance. I mean, you want a low maintenance plant, this is the one to go for. All right, so let me get these out of the way so we can move on. So the next one I wanna talk about is Nandina. So Nandina, you probably have all seen before. Um, some people might get a little bit bored by them, but I find that if you have a spot in your yard that you know you can't get to a lot, you know you just don't want to mess with, um, and you just want some color and you want some some sort of shrub to kind of consume that space, uh, Nandina is absolutely a great plant. It's super low maintenance, can take sun to shade, it can grow anywhere, um, and these get super, super intense red color in the winter. 
Um, now, you're going to get the best red color in the winter if they're sitting in full sun. So if you're growing them in a wooded area and the trees fall off the leaves, that will help them get a little bit more intense red. But a full sun color uh, is really, really red in the winter. But in the shade, they do just as good. Um, so this is Nandina Firepower. And these are all 30% off right now, I think. Yep, 30% off. They're $44.99 each. This is Gulfstream, and this is Nandina Firepower. Nandina Firepower is a dwarf. It only gets about uh, two to two feet high by about two feet wide, maybe three feet high, two feet wide. Kind of a little gumdrop shape. Uh, it's just kind of a cute little plant, very easy to grow, super drought tolerant. Uh, one of the best ones to grow out there. Now these don't actually get a lot of flowers or berries, like you're probably used to the domestic Nandina which looks a little bit like this one. This is Gulfstream. Domestic, I didn't see any out there when I was walking around. I'm sure we still have some domestic Nandina, uh, but d domestic Nandina is similar to like the Heavenly Bamboo. Those get about five to six feet tall. I love Gulfstream because it looks similar in the leaf, um, but it only gets about three to four feet high and wide. Full sun to shade. It does get little pockets of white flowers and then red berries, um, but super, super easy to grow. Um, and just doesn't need a lot of maintenance, kind of a fuller kind of Gulf Stream. So the Gulf Stream gets a little bit, stays a little bit fuller, four by four, whereas the domestic Nandina kind of looks like bamboo because it usually loses most of its leaves on the bottom and it kind of has that bamboo look. Uh, but this is a great one. And these that just came in are absolutely sunny. I mean, look at that color. Just can't beat that bright red color. Really, really pretty. So these are both uh, on sale right now, $44.99 regular price and they're 30% off right now. So Come in and try these out. These are great, again, for foundation plantings, mass plantings, um, small hedges, small borders, really, really easy plant to grow, or just a specimen plant, or just a grouping. I love to group them in threes or fives, kind of out in the landscape somewhere, because I know I'm not gonna have to worry about maintaining them too much. You really don't have to do much to them at all. Every once in a while, you might get a kind of sprig of kind of wild growth. You just go in and clip that out, super, super easy. Other than that, they stay nice and compact. You don't have to do much with them. And they don't really, they're not a shrub that you would typically kind of hedge or kind of box off or round off. They just kind of have this natural shape to them. They make some noise in the garden as well, which is really pretty. Um, and it's just a really, really easy shrub to grow. So if you're looking for a durable, tough plant, low maintenance, one of these two guys is gonna work great for you. Gulfstream Nandina or Firepower Nandina. All right, so then the next one, talking about let me put some of these over here. Talking about shaping our plants, uh, boxwood is a great one. So boxwoods are super, super popular. I know they're just basic green, but they're very easy to grow. There's lots and lots of different varieties and lots of different sizes. So here's kind of like your basic old English boxwood. Now this is called Woodburn Select. So if you're coming in looking for an old English boxwood, I think we do have a couple, but this is the Woodburn Select, which is basically a, a slightly stronger, hardier variety of the old English boxwoods. What's really, really popular about the old English boxwoods is they're very slow growing. <laughs> so the ones in Williamsburg that are four by four, six by six have been there for a very long time. The best way that I can describe this is uh, we had them in the front of my mom's home for probably my entire childhood, um, even to when I started working here at the garden center. Eventually I went and took them out because they were still two by two, three by three. They have never grown much. Um, so I changed them out with another boxwood, which is baby Jim boxwood. And baby Jim boxwood, which is this one right here, grows a little bit faster. It's not quite as defined a shape as your old English boxwood, but it's really, really an easy boxwood to grow. It doesn't have a lot of disease or insect issues. Um, very, very tough boxwood. It's been hybridized um, and it gets about four by four and it can get there fairly quickly. Um, the winter gym boxwood, which is basically what this is uh, spawned off of, baby gym, winter gym. The winter gym boxwood gets a little bit faster growing. So it gets about five to six feet high and wide. And so baby gym is what you're gonna see more often in our garden centers uh, because it fits the kind of the need of a boxwood, which is smaller. It uh, doesn't grow crazy fast. You don't have to do a lot of pruning to it. Um, kind of forms a nice little compact shape. You might have to shape it a little bit, um, just a little bit, but the old English boxwood grows in this kind of perfect shape like this. Um, what is that called? So it's boxwood. This is Woodburn Select boxwood. The first boxwood is called Woodburn Select. Um, and so that's kind of forms this nice rounded shape. Now you can shape these winter gem or baby gem boxwoods. So you can shape them lightly if you need to. But the old English boxwood is that classic 
little kind of lollipop round shape. This is another one. This is from Monrovia. This is called Petite Pillar Dwarf Boxwood. Very similar again to the Old English Boxwood. Uh, this one gets about two by two. So you can see that picture there on the Monrovia tag, how it's got that nice little rounded shape. Really, really pretty. The boxwoods aren't on sale right now. You're typically not gonna get boxwoods on sale um, because they're very prized, they're highly collected, um, and they're very slow growing. So this wood burn select right here, this boxwood is, see I thought I had a price on it, yep, $59.99. So they're kind of pricey, but this plant right here has been growing for probably three to six years, somewhere in that range. It's, it's very, very slow growing. They form this natural shape by themselves. Every once in a while, you might get these little sprigs of growth that you might have to do a little bit of prune on, but it forms just a nice little rounded shape by itself. They're really pretty, a classic in the garden. Now, I do prefer boxwoods to have a little bit of shade, and there's lots of different sizes as well. Um, but I prefer them to have a little bit of shade. I think they do best with a little shade. In full sun, they do okay. Old English boxwoods, probably not as much. I, if you've got a full sun location, I would probably stick with the baby gym. They've been designed to kind of take that full sun. Um, if you get that orangey color in your boxwoods, that's typically a boxwood that gets too much sun in the winter time frame. So it doesn't really hurt the plant, usually isn't an issue. It kicks right back out of the orange color. You can actually see I don't know if you can quite see, but there's a little bit of that orange in here. Um, and it's kicking right out of that. As this warm weather comes up, um, as we get warmer and warmer, you'll get the leaves turning back green. Now the winter gym doesn't get really hurt or the baby gym doesn't really get hurt that much by it. But an old English boxwood over time in full sun, especially in the winter time frame and in the summer really too, puts a lot of stress on the plant. Um, and it's harder and harder for it to kind of kick it out of, the, out, of that, out of that orange color. And then again, in the, in the summer, when you get a lot of full sun on these plants, they can struggle a little bit. So Old English boxwoods are great. Do provide a little bit of shade if you can for them, but they're awesome in a pot. You know, I love you know, seeing these in like the Southern Living magazines where they're in just a nice terracotta pot and you've got them all lined up. Uh, they look great as foundation plantings if you've got a little bit of shade, a small border, uh, because they don't grow very big and they're gonna take a long time to grow but they can live for years and years and years and really can actually raise um, the, the value in your landscape because they're highly collected, especially big ones. Um, so a big old English boxwood is really, really pretty um, and has been around for a long time. So boxwoods are really cool. Here's another one that I wanted to show. This is called green velvet boxwood. So green velvet has a little bit of a variegation to it. So you can kind of probably see that on, your, on the screen where it's got all these little kind of almost yellow to white margins on the leaves. So it gives it that really kind of cool look. So compared to this one, you can see it's just a little bit of a brighter color. Um, they do prefer a little bit of shade again. Uh, they can take a little bit more sun. And this one gets about, I think it's three by three. Yeah, three feet high and three feet wide. So that's the green velvet boxwood. Really pretty variegation on it. So it just adds a little bit of different color, a little bit of a different shape to it as well. So it's a little bit more natural, but could be pruned and sheared. Uh, boxwoods love to be pruned. It doesn't hurt them at all. Uh, back in the colonial times in Williamsburg, they used to pick them. So they would actually use their fingers and pick the, the, um, the branches so that they could hedge them and, and shear them into a shape. Uh, so they would actually do it by hand. Uh, but now you can use just a pair of pruners. You can even use electric shears if you wanted to on them. Some people don't love it because when you cut the leaf of a boxwood, it can kind of create a little bit of a white margin as it heals. Um, but typically you don't see it and usually you're just pruning lightly to kind of shape, especially an old English boxwood or a baby gym boxwood. So we've got a lot of different collections of boxwoods here. Um, Yes, so Kimberly, this is being recorded. Um, it'll be on our Facebook page for a while. Because we're talking about sales, um, then uh, we probably won't keep it on our Facebook page too long, but you can definitely go back and check out. I've done lots and lots of webinars, Kimberly, where I've talked about boxwoods and different shrubs. So you can go to our website and you can check out the whole collection of all the webinars out there that have been recorded and have notes attached to them as well. These are more talking about what's going on right now and what we have right now. So we'll keep it up for a little while for you. All right. So boxwoods are another good one. And we've got a great selection of boxwoods right now. So if you're looking for some boxwoods, I would come in soon uh, because they don't always stick around forever. All right, what else do I wanna talk about? Is there anything else that's really, really good on sale? So yeah, the, this one's really good. So all of our roses, all of our ready plant roses, I always like to show these. There's a great collection right now. Roses that are actually growing 
um, that have blooms on them um, are not going to be in probably until mid-April, even the end of April before we get those in. So if you're looking to get some roses and get some roses started, this is a great time to come and get these ready pot roses. These are 30% off. We've got a huge collection. I just grabbed this one. This one's called Stiletto. It's a red, um, really pretty bloom. But uh, these dormant roses are real easy to plant because they have a uh, fiber pot in here, a basically a cocoa peat pot. So you just take this plastic bag off and then you can plant it right in the ground. You don't have to disturb the root system or anything. Um, and it'll just biodegrade over time in the ground. Uh, roses are super, super collectible. They also are very uh, rewarding and they reward you in the first year. These are long stem roses. So these are like your Floribundas, Grandifloras, Hybrid Teas. Um, they do require some specific pruning, but that's all things that we can help you with. I've done videos on them, so you can check that out. Uh, but there's lots and lots of different styles, lots of different fragrances. But what I love about roses is you can get these um, to grow in the first year, four to five feet tall typically, and you'll get tons of blooms. So it's kind of that really satisfying plant because in one year you're gonna get a full shrub and you can do lots of, and get lots of blooms off of it. So great cut flower. So if you're thinking about roses this season, it's a good time to come and get these because they are 30% off as well. All right, so the next shrub I want to show you is becoming one of my favorites. Let's see, did I bring, I thought I had two varieties of it, but I don't know if I brought both of them in. So this is Abelia, and I don't know that I have the Kaleidoscope Abelia. I might have forgot that guy. So Kaleidoscope Abelia, and this is Confetti, I think. Let me check that name. They've changed these names multiple times. Uh, let's see, Radiance. So this one's called Radiance. Now these are just regular price right now, but a really pretty plant. So what a lot of times, and I'll bring this other one up, I think a lot of times people ask for, this is kind of a very common question that we get here at the Garden Center. I want a um, evergreen shrub that is going to bloom uh, and loves full sun. Well, there's not a whole lot that meet that criteria. Full sun, evergreen, and blooms. So the Indian hawthorn that I showed you earlier is one. Indian hawthorn would work, but abelia is a great option. The kaleidoscope has more of kind of an orangey yellow color to it, whereas this radiance is more white and green. So it's, it depends on what kind of landscape uh, design you're looking at or what uh, color you prefer. Uh, but these are evergreen shrubs, very low growing. So they only get about two to three feet high and about four to five feet wide. So it's a little dome shaped shrub again. And these get white flowers in the, in the summertime that uh, the bees and the butterflies absolutely love. So it's a great pollinator plant as well. Very easy to grow, very drought tolerant. Uh, the only maintenance that really needs to be done on it is it will get some kind of wild sprigs of growth. And every once in a while, you'll need to go and prune those back to kind of keep it nice and shaped. But other than that, it is a super, super plant. Abelia. This one is Abelia Radiance. Um, and then the other one that we carry a lot of is Abelia Kaleidoscope, which I could have swore I grabbed, but I guess I didn't. I apologize. But you got to come in and check them out. So Abelia Radiance or Abelia Kaleidoscope, super easy plant to grow. Uh, deer resistant, rabbit resistant, nothing messes with them. Uh, blooms with white blooms in the summer. Um, and very, very easy to grow, very drought tolerant, uh, and one of the best evergreen blooming shrubs. The other one is Loripetalum. So Loripetalum is a great one as well, evergreen, blooms with a pinkish colored flower, maybe almost red, pink to red flowers, um, and it's got this great burgundy color. It's evergreen, it blooms, and it loves full sun. So this is what the blooms look like. You can maybe see that on that picture little fringy kind of pink flowers that kind of hang, um, but they're really pretty when they're in full bloom. They're very, very easy shrub to grow. They do have this kind of natural shape to them, but typically get in that four to five foot range. Uh, some might even get to five to six feet tall. So this one is called Cherry Blast, and this one gets about five by five, um, but it's a great evergreen shrub, and it's awesome when you want to play some contrast in the garden. So when you're, when you're kind of doing landscape design, you kind of are always looking maybe for some contrasting colors, lots of greens obviously, but throwing in some reds with the Nandinas or some blooms with uh, your Encore Azaleas or your Indian Hawthorn. But then when you've got a nice dark burgundy shrub like this, almost purple, then throwing in a lighter color with it really creates a lot of contrast and texture. And that's what we're trying to do in the landscapers. We're trying to change up our different colors and textures um, and have some contrasting colors. And Laura Petalum is one of my favorites for that. Uh, and there's lots and lots of different styles, lots and lots of different varieties of well as well. So some that maybe get one feet high by three feet wide, you know, almost a ground cover. 
to some that get huge, like 10 to 12 feet high and wide. This one's kind of right in that middle range, which is a good size for the landscape. Six by six, five by five, somewhere in that range. You can actually hedge them and shear them so you can make them boxy or you can round them off. Uh, really, really good. Um, so this is a uh, great Laura Petalum and Abelia are both awesome, full sun, blooming evergreen shrubs. So with Indian Hawthorn, your Abelia and your Laura Petalum, you can get lots and lots of blooms in full sun and an evergreen plant. Really great for the front yard. I love using evergreens in the front yard. And when I say evergreens, I know a lot of people probably think conifers and you probably, I don't even know that I have a conifer in here. I don't think I do. Uh, or yeah, here we go. You know, your gold mop cypress, which I'm going to get to next. Uh, but conifers are evergreens, but there are broadleaf evergreens as well. And Abelia and Laura Petalum and Indian Hawthorn fall into that classification. So really, really nice plants. Um, and we've got a great selection of the Abelias right now. It's a really, really good plant. I think somebody had a question about any thornless roses. So there is one rose that I know of. Now, there, there are some thornless roses out there. But typically what that means is they're going to have less thorns in them. And a lot of them will re revert back to having thorns. So we don't typically sell a thornless uh, rose. There is a climbing rose, a vine rose, that, um, that you can grow um, as a vine, and it is thornless. So there's that option. It's kind of got a white uh, to yellowish colored bloom. Really, really pretty. And I've actually got some vines here, so I can uh, pull some of those out here in a minute. All right, so let's go to some other spring blooming plants um, that maybe you haven't seen as much, but this one is called Pieris. Uh, so Pieris is a really popular plant. I think Monrovia actually calls it the lily of the valley shrub. So it looks like lily of the valley, but it's a shrub. It's called Pieris. Um, it's kind of what we sell instead of laurels. So I know I've seen a couple people ask um, about laurels before. Laurels typically get shot hole fungus in this area. They have a big issue with fungus and disease in this area, and this one doesn't. Um, and so it looks very similar to a laurel. Uh, there's lots and lots of different varieties of this as well. This one is a compact uh, variety. I think it's called Prelude, if that's correct. I don't know if this one has the variety actually on there, but there's a lot of different ones. So this one's Tiki. That's right. So Tiki, Prelude, they're the dwarf. There's a white bloom. There are some that get kind of a raspberry purplish colored bloom to pink bloom. Um, but this one's really pretty with that white and it's a nice kind of full little shrub. Only gets about two by two. And these prefer a little bit of shade. So it's a great shade garden plant. Think of kind of like in the azaleas, uh, boxwood areas. This is a great shrub. Evergreen with blooms, uh, blooms here in the spring. That's about it. But the new growth on most of these is really pretty as well. Sometimes it's almost fiery red to a very, very dark maroon color. So Pierre's, there's lots and lots of different options of those in the store right now. So Darlene asked, is there barberry? Barberry is another shrub that I was going to show. So barberry is a good option. Um, barberry has little tiny thorns all over it. Um, but barberry is a deciduous shrub, but it has awesome colors. So this one's a burgundy one. This one's called Golden Ruby. So it's got that really pretty red color just coming out. Not a whole lot to show you because it's just starting to leaf out. But when these get full of leaves, they are bright, bright red. And man, do they add a lot of contrast to the landscape. So these are really, really good. This one's golden ruby, and I think it only gets about two by two. It's a smaller one. Yep, two feet high and two feet wide. So another really pretty one. So not a whole lot to show there. This is another great one. I love this one for uh, the full sun areas in our yard. This is called Gold Mop Cypress uh, or Golden Charm. I can't remember which one. Yep, Golden Charm. So Golden Charm gets about three to four feet high and wide. Uh, it's got this natural shape to it. I've actually seen people shear these and you can shear them to a little bit of a tighter compact shape. Um, I do recommend pruning them every once in a while. Maybe I usually do mine about twice a year. They're deer and rabbit resistant. Nothing really messes with them. They're actually pretty drought tolerant once they get established, but that gorgeous gold color is just amazing. In the winter, you might get a little bit more of an orangey gold color, which is kind of cool. Mine are still kind of in that orangey uh, kind of rusty look, which I think is kind of a pretty color in the winter. But then they'll kick out and have this gold color in the spring all the way through the summer into the fall. And it's just a great, again, texture, has some movement in the landscape. These are awesome, again, for mass plantings, love full sun. In the shade, I've actually seen them grow a little bit, not, I wouldn't say full shade for sure, uh, but in, in a light dappled shade, uh, then these will actually go more to the green color. So you see that kind of green color that it's got in there. So you'll lose this golden color if you don't get full sun on them. 
Um, but a really, really good shrub, very drought tolerant, doesn't have a lot of disease or insect issues. I don't really prune mine other than to take the sprays out. So every once in a while, I'll get a spray. If you don't prune them, what I will tell you is they can get some good size on them. There's a couple different varieties of gold mop cypress, gold mop and golden charm. Golden charm gets about three by three, four by four. Gold mop cypresses can get six to seven feet high and wide. Uh, and you might want to prune those to kind of keep them compact. And they take to pruning pretty well. The only thing you want to be careful with when you're pruning a conifer plant is as it gets bigger, it shades the inside of itself. So it's a bigger plant. Let's imagine like a three by three golden mop cypress and no sun is going to get to the inside of that plant, which means it's going to hollow out a little bit. You don't see it, doesn't matter, matter to you, but if you shear it really hard and you cut into an area of the plant that doesn't have any leaves, it might not come back from that. So that's the only thing you got to be careful with with conifers is if you cut it too far, if you cut it to the point where there's no foliage on it, it might not come back from that. Um, let's see, so my favorite are mountain laurel and orange azaleas. Yep, so I've got the orange azaleas. Mountain laurels I don't carry much of. Every once in a while we might have a couple pop in here, uh, but typically uh, laurels in this area struggle with a little bit of the fungus and disease issues, um, unfortunately. Um, so knockout roses and double bloom are my favorite. That's an awesome one. Uh, any blueberry bushes that would work well in the shade in this area. So Jeremy, uh, we do have blueberry bushes. We just got a small group in. We've got more coming in. Uh, so maybe give us a week or two to kind of fill in with the blueberry bushes, but we do have some now. Uh, blueberries, really any kind of fruit, fruiting plant is going to want full sun. Uh, so in a little bit of shade, I think you'd be okay, but you're probably not going to get as many blooms. And when you don't get as many blooms, you don't get as many blueberries. Uh, but I think they would be fine in a little bit of shade. The plant itself will do fine. It just isn't going to bloom as profusely as you probably want, Jeremy. So uh, try uh, maybe a little bit of a sunnier spot if you've got that. Uh, so they don't, they would work in shade, but they won't bloom as much and you won't get as much fruit. All right. So let's see, what else do I want to show you? I got a couple other things here that I think are kind of cool. This is another cool one that I always kind of like to show off. This is from Monrovia as well. This is um, a U, a plum U. Um, so a false U or a plum U is what they call it. Uh, but U is really cool because it's evergreen. It's kind of neo-like, so it's almost like a conifer. But these can take to shade really well. Uh, they're very, very drought tolerant, very easy shrubs to grow. So just kind of a cool look. Um, and there's lots and lots of different varieties, some that uh, spread out on the ground, some that get that grow straight upright in a columnar habit. Uh, they're just kind of different and something that you don't see that's, I think, kind of unusual. Um, and when the new growth comes out, you can see all of these little buds in there about to crack open. That's all the new growth. It's kind of this lime green color. So you get this lime green on the dark green, uh, older leaves. It's really, really different and unusual. So really kind of cool one. This one is the spreading you. So this one actually is more of a, the ground cover. So I think it gets about two feet tall by about four feet wide. Yep. Two to three feet tall by about four to five feet wide. So really, really kind of cool different plant. Uh, let's see. This is another one of my favorites. This is Mahonia. Um, I think I saw somebody mention Mahonia earlier. There's a leather leaf Mahonia that's really, really thorny and really prickly. I won't say thorny, but it's kind of got a holly leaf. So it's got lots and lots of prickles on the outside. It's kind of a tough plant, uh, but this one is really cool. This one's called Soft Caress Mahonia. It gets about three by three and it loves a little bit of shade. It'll actually get little pockets of yellow blooms, which are kind of cool, uh, but it just reminds me of a fern, but it gets nice size. It's really, really durable grows really, really great in the shade. It's deer and rabbit resistant. It's an awesome, awesome plant. So Mahonia Soft Caress. I just like that kind of ferny look, really different and unusual and something that uh, will grow well in our shady areas. And shade sometimes, you know, we need a little diversity. Uh, and I think this adds a little bit of that uh, cool texture to a shade garden. So about three to four feet high and wide um, and loves it in the shade, uh, deep shade to part shade. So it really grows great in all of those. I know I mentioned hydrangeas. We do have a good collection of hydrangeas in right now. Uh, of course, the Endless Summer brand is a great uh, type of uh, hydrangea. This is a Summer Crush, which was, I think, was it new last year? Maybe it was two years ago now. Um, and it's kind of got that raspberry kind of red colored bloom, really pretty. And then, of course, the uh, original Endless Summer, 
with the blue blooms. Uh, we've got lots and lots of endless summer in right now. We've even got a couple different collections. Um, so we'll get more and more hydrangeas in. I know they're not much to look at, but it's a great time to plant them um, and get them in the ground, get them established if you can get them. Um, and then uh, when they start to leaf out and bloom, uh, you probably won't have to worry about them too much. Um, so hydrangeas are a great option. And most hydrangeas like shade. So if you're, if you're wondering where to plant your hydrangeas, plant them in some shade. This is yucca. This is, I love yucca. Yucca is really kind of different and unusual. If you're looking uh, for a very drought tolerant, very low maintenance shrub, this would be a great option for you. Um, this one's called Color Guard Yucca. So Color Guard Yucca is actually going to have a little bit of, I don't know if you can quite see it, but there's like a pink kind of color in there in the older leaves. The new leaves are uh, yellow with a green margin on the outside. That image on the label might show you a little better. I know we've got a little glare there. But really, really pretty shrub. Uh, small plant, I guess you could call it. Evergreen. Gets the yucca spike with the flowers of the white blooms coming out in the summer months. Uh, really cool. This is an older one. This is a bigger one here. You can just see how cool that is. And what I always kind of hated about yuccas <laughs> is how spiky they are. But this one's actually not too bad. Um, now the newer leaves when they come out do have a thorn on the end or a spike on the end and they're a little bit more rigid but as the plant gets older and those leaves get older um, it doesn't quite get as spiky so you can actually put your hand on the end of it and you're not going to get spiked up too bad. Uh, so it's a nice softer yucca um, and not quite as, as hard to work with. Uh, really easy to kind of clean up over time too which is what I like so um, as these leaves get old they'll start to fade. You don't necessarily have to do it but every once in a while, I'll go in and just kind of pick them out. And you can see how easily that kind of pulls off. And because it's a softer yucca to work with, that's why I like it. So it's got a green outer edge with a yellow center. And then sometimes on the older leaves, you'll get a little bit of that pinkish color. I don't know if you can quite see that in there. Really cool plant. So yucca color guard is another kind of cool one, especially for um, the full sun kind of dry areas. All right, let's see. I think I'm getting pretty close to getting there. Um, the last one. Well, maybe not the last one. I got a couple more. So spring would not be here if it wasn't for forsythia. I know it's not a whole lot to look at, but it's budding up. Um, when spring arrives here in the Hampton Roads area, you will usually see forsythia blooming all over the place. And so that's going to happen pretty soon. Um, so forsythia is a great shrub. It's deciduous. Blooms in the springtime with all those yellow flowers. I'm sure a lot of you know forsythia, but I wanted to grab one and bring it in here and just show you. We do have them. It's a great time to get them. It's usually about the only time of the year that we have them. Um, so come in and get them soon because they're not going to last super, super long. Uh, but forsythia is the sign of spring here in Hampton Roads. Forsythia, daffodils, um, all of those kind of early spring bloomers are a great sign that spring is on its way. So forsythia, we've got this one I think is Linwood Gold. Spring Glory, but we also have Linwood Gold as well. Uh, but most of them look very similar. Get about five by five to six by six. Loses their leaves, but in the summer when they've got the green leaves, they're absolutely gorgeous. Have a little bit of movement, a little bit of a different natural shape. So for Scythia is a really, really pretty one. All right. And I also, I, mi I missed this one. So this is Daphne, Daphne Odora. Um, amazing fragrance to it. It's really, really pretty plant. So when it buds up, I wanted to bring this one in because you can see those raspberry kind of purpley colored blooms. Uh, when this buds up in the spring uh, or early, late winter really, um, then those buds have that color. Then when it opens up, it's white. I don't know if you can quite see. I think I have one in here that was blooming. Yep. So you can see as it opens up there, that white bloom. So these clusters will turn completely white. Um, so Daphne Odora, the issue that I think most people have with these, it's an evergreen shrub, is they can get root rot. So remember I mentioned that earlier with rhododendrons about root rot? Most plants that grow kind of in the mountainous regions um, like good drainage. So think about like rhododendrons naturally grow in the mountains of Virginia. Um, and as the, they get their water, but then it goes away very quickly. So what I always like to do with plants that have root rot issues is plant them on a little bit of a hill or on their own little mountain. So when you plant a shrub like this, you want to plant it high. And what that means is about two to three inches above grade of soil. Uh, so let me see if I can show you that here with this one gently pull it out. So let's say this pot is my level of my soil. So I'm going to plant it in the ground like that, about three to four inches above grade. And then I'm going to take a little bit of extra soil and just come to the side of that. 
you don't want to put any dirt on top of it. So this root ball on the top of the root ball has all these fine little fairy kind of like hairy little roots. Um, and those are the ones that can, if they get waterlogged, that it can really kill the plant very quickly. So make sure to plant it high. It also works great in a container. Uh, you can grow these um, in a pot and then you can bring it close to the front door in the winter when, or late winter, early spring when it starts to bloom and you get that amazing fragrance. And then you can put it somewhere else in the yard. They do prefer a little bit of shade, so they prefer um, afternoon shade if possible. Um, but Daphne Odor is a great evergreen bloomer, amazing fragrance. Smells kind of like a sweet gardenia almost. Uh, let's see. Um, I have a color guy yucca in tall containers in my backyard. Love them. Awesome, Angelina. That is awesome. Um, and let's see, what about hardy gardenias? So, yep, we've also got gardenias. I brought one in. Uh, gardenias will get more and more in as we get closer to, uh, you know, mid-spring. Um, but gardenias are a gorgeous plant. This one I think is called August Beauty. Yep, August Beauty. August Beauty gets about five to six feet high and wide. Uh, great fragrance. Uh, gardenias are awesome. I know a lot of people, uh, when they were asked what their favorite plant is, um, gardenias were one of the number one uh, recommended plants. So gardenias have that great fragrance, pure white blooms. There's lots and lots of varieties now. August Beauty is a really, really good one. Uh, it blooms in the spring and again in the fall almost, late, late summer. That's why they call it August Beauty because it can have a repeat bloom. Uh, Chuck Hayes is probably one of the most popular varieties in this area. Uh, Chuck Hayes is a very winter hardy variety. Um, a nice size only gets about three by three, four by four. Huge white blooms, really, really fragrant. Um, there's also radicans, which is a little bit of a lower growing one. And then there's first love. There's, uh, there's a lot of new varieties that are coming out all the time. And most of them are very hardy in this area. Otherwise, we wouldn't carry them. Uh, so, Tammy, thank you for mentioning that. Um, what's the mature height on the Daphne? The Daphne is about three by three shrub. So it gets a nice kind of full, kind of almost boxwood shape, really, really rounded um, and really, really pretty. Just watch out for that root rot. Great in a container, great in the shade. Uh, just make sure that it dries out. It wants to get its water, but it also wants it to go away fairly quickly. So planting it on its own little hill is a great option for your Daphne. Uh, gardenias, uh, the only thing that I will really recommend for gardenias is make sure to give it enough iron. Um, gardenias need iron to produce those blooms. And so a lot of times when gardenias are done blooming, you'll get a lot of yellowing leaves. That's natural. It'll drop some of them. But if it gets really, really bad and you start to see even more yellowing, iron is what gardenias need. And like our green leaf fertilizer that we sell here at McDonald Garden Center is a great option. Uh, it's got lots of iron in it. Sometimes you might even need to go with a liquid or a granulized iron, just specifically iron to kind of uh, get that plant to green back up. Uh, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of iron to put these blooms out for gardenias. So watch that. Other than that, gardenias really are pretty versatile. I think they grow pretty well in the shade, um, but full sun works as well. So they're pretty versatile there. Um, full sun, you typically are going to get a little bit more blooms, but you might run into more iron deficiency and you might have to supply a little bit more iron. In the shade, it won't bloom as heavily, which means it won't require as much uh, uh, care after it blooms. Uh, but they're great shrubs and the fragrance is absolutely amazing. They make great cut flowers. Um, I like to put them you know, underneath like a bedroom window so, or on a front porch or near a front porch. Uh, you can grow one, you can grow them as a border plant, uh, hedges, um, and also just groupings works really, really well. But put it in an area that you think you might be able to enjoy the fragrance. Um, you can of course cut off the flowers and bring them inside but you can also put them like near a front porch or a bedroom window. So on a nice, you know, early spring day where you got a cool weather outside, you can open up your window and get that great fragrance from gardenias. They typically are gonna bloom in that mid to late spring period. Um, and then some will actually repeat bloom again in the fall. Uh, so gardenias are a great option. We do have some August beauties in right now. Um, and we've got a couple other varieties, I think, uh, but we'll get more and more of those as we kind of get into the, uh, closer to the mid spring period. All right, so the next thing I want to tell you is a bush slash tree. It kind of works both ways. And that is Japanese maples. I know I don't have a lot right here or a lot to show you because they kind of look like twigs. But here's one behind me with this great coral bark color. I don't think this is Sango Kaku. Sango Kaku is probably the most popular kind of pink barked. Uh, Japanese maple, but this one's called Baton Rouge. Uh, but all the Japanese maples are 40% off right now. Well, not all of them. The one gallons, the three gallons, and the little tiny cutie, uh, let's see, I don't know if I have, 
I had a little tiny one, so they also come in like a little tiny pot. I could have swore I brought one in here, but I don't see it. So there's the smallest little size, I think it's $24.99, $29.99. And then these one gallon sizes, which are about $69.99. Um, and then you've got your three gallon size, which are typically in that $159 to $179 range. But they're all 40% off right now. And they're hugely collectible. I think there's over 12,000 different varieties of Japanese maples right now. Um, and so they're really, really cool. They're really collectible. Uh, and there's a huge range in sizes as well. So like this one's a really fun one. This one's called uh, Makawa Yatsabusa. And this one actually is very small. and only gets about three to four feet high and wide. Very bonsai-like. Um, this one is your red leaf variety, which is uh, Kawaro Rose. So there's lots and lots of different ones like Blood Good, Emperor One are some pretty popular names, uh, but those can get 15 to 20 feet tall. Uh, so there's a huge range in how big they can grow from two feet to two feet wide, two feet tall to two feet wide, all the way to 20 feet tall. Um, so you've got a huge collection and then all the sizes in between. They come with red leaves or green leaves. They can have a dissected leaf, which is a very kind of kind of fine leaf and usually those are gonna have a, a, a weeping habit. Um, and then of course there's your broad leaf ones like the big red leaf varieties but they also come in green leaves. Uh, there's 12,000 different varieties. We don't carry them all uh, but we probably have a good selection of maybe over, I think it's probably over 100, 150 different varieties right now. Um, and it's a great time to come and get these little guys in too. Uh, this was one of the first plants I ever purchased. It was a one gallon Japanese maple 17 years ago and I just planted it in the ground uh, last year. So I grew it in a container for a long time. Uh, so they can grow in pots for a long time. They're awesome in the landscape. They can really up the value of your landscape as well because they're highly collectible and they're very, very expensive when you get to an old one. Um, so they're nice and slow growing. You can bonsai them. You can let them just grow naturally as a shrub almost. Uh, they have four, I, I think four seasons of interest because the spring when the leaves come out, like this one's just starting to leaf out, they have amazing leaf color in the spring. And then in the summer, they're really cool because a lot of them have those you know, we uh, weeping habits or those dissected leaves um, and are really, really interesting to look at. And then in the fall, the color intensifies again before the leaves fall off. And then in the winter, you get this really cool bark interest. I mean, this one's got a green bark, really kind of cool looking. It has all these little notches on it, of course. The Baton Rouge or the coral bark, Japanese maples have that really pretty bark color. But even the red leaf varieties get a red color on their bark, uh, or kind of a maroon color, I should say. So really, really interesting. Japanese maples, this is a weeping habit one, so you can see kind of that really cool kind of bonsai weeping shape. This one's called uh, emerald lace, which is a green lace leaf uh, Japanese maple. So there's lace leaf, the dissected maples have a, a, typically a weeping habit to them. So lots and lots of different styles and shapes of these. Japanese maples are absolutely amazing. Now we realize that they don't have leaves on them. So you really don't know what they look like. So right now at the garden centers at both locations at Great Neck and here at Independence, we have a slideshow that you can go and kind of check out and see all the different types of Japanese maples. We can help you kind of sort through those. So if you find one like emerald lace and you say, I want to know what this looks like, we can show you a picture and give you a little description on all of them. So we've got that going on right now. Japanese maples are super, super collectible um, and really, really fun to look at and really fun to collect. Um, you know, I definitely have had lots of different varieties in my home before. Um, I still carry a bunch in containers still um, and love to kind of grow them in pots and kind of grow them out and then plant them around or give them as gifts later on. I love to kind of give them to some of my family members to uh, allow them to grow in their yards for years to come. So Japanese maples are super, super popular. There's lots and lots to see here at the store. I could go on and on. I, I think I've gotten through a majority of what I wanted to get through. Well, one more. I'll do one more because I think somebody mentioned this earlier which is lilac. So I know I saw, especially when people were listing all their favorite shrubs, lilac is a very, very popular shrub um, because of that fragrance and that purple bloom. Lilac is a tough one here in the Hampton Roads area. And the reason is, is because our soil is acidic. It's naturally acidic. Um, and where do you find the best lilac is typically Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, up north, they have more alkaline soil. And alkaline soils are what lilacs need to bloom the best and have the best fragrance. Um, this one is called Bloomerang Lilac and does perfectly fine in our acidic soil. It's a good sized shrub. It gets about three to four feet high and wide. Uh, you can see it leafing out right now. 
and it's got all these little buds coming on it right now as well. You can see all these little dark purple buds on it. Very fragrant, but it does very well in the Hampton Roads area. So if you've ever tried a lilac and failed, and maybe you know, it just didn't quite perform for you, try this Bloomerang Lilac. It is a great option. A little bit smaller of a shrub, doesn't get quite as big as, as your typical northern lilacs that can get six to eight feet high and wide. This one only gets about four by four, so it's a dwarf. Smaller blooms, but still just as fragrant as all the other lilacs, uh, and does very well in our acidic soil. Full sun, can actually take a little bit of shade, um, so it's a pretty versatile plant. It is deciduous, it'll lose its leaves in the winter, uh, but it's a great spring blooming uh, lilac. Really, really pretty. All right, I think I've gotten through pretty much everything now. I know I keep saying that, I keep finding some. I brought a lot of stuff in here, but I think I got through pretty much everything. Um, so there's a huge collection of shrubs right now, very valuable in the landscape, um, and really add a lot of value and are the structure um, and the backbone of any good landscape, whether you're planting them as specimen plants or groupings. I love to do groupings. You probably heard me say that a lot today, uh, but grouping them in groups of threes to fives, you typically want to do odd numbers uh, if you can in your landscape design. Uh, they work great as your hedges um, or uh, uh, border plants um, or the foundation shrubs of your home. So really, really great options here. There's tons of them. You can grow all of these in containers or in the ground. They're awesome to collect. They're so much fun and there's such a huge diversity in our shrubs right now. Um, so it's a great time to come in. We've got some great deals, as I mentioned on the Encore Azaleas, the Japanese Maples, the Indian Hawthorn, the Nandinas. Uh, there's lots and lots of great deals right now. So come in and check us out. Our showcase ends March 14th, which is this Sunday. So come in and get some great deals this weekend. I'll see if there's any other questions. And if not, I hope you all have a great day. So let's see. So Barbara said, what shrubs can you recommend for wet areas? Well, there definitely are some shrubs that you can grow in some wetter areas. Um, there used to be one that we carried all the time. And I don't think we've had it for a while, which is inkberry holly. Uh, inkberry holly can take a little bit of moisture. Uh, let's see, uh, for a larger shrub, you could do the bayberry or wax myrtle. They can take uh, very, very wet soils. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of what we have in stock right now that can take pretty wet soil. I have a lot of perennials that can take wet soil. Some of the grasses can take it pretty well. Uh, so like your pampas grass, uh, there's a chorus or juncus that kind of look like grasses. Irises can actually take a fair amount of moisture. Um, shrubs right now, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that can really take a lot of moisture. Um, maybe pittosporum, pittosporum can take it fairly wet. Uh, and we've got some of those. Um, I'll have to come back to that and see if I can come up with some other options. Uh, there are some of the viburnums out there that we do carry. Uh, viburnums can take a fair amount of moisture if it's a wet area. So I'll, I'll get back to you on that one, um, uh, Barbara, and see if I can come up with a little bit of a better list. Uh, maybe some things that aren't here yet that will be coming in soon. But there's a lot of options in the perennial world that can take, I mean, really almost grow in straight water. Uh, I think of like the horsetail reed grass that we have right now. Really kind of cool looking, um, and that can grow in straight water, but also in very wet areas. So good options there, hopefully that helps. Um, Tammy, I answered the question on the Daphne. My favorite are hydrangeas, gardenias, and peonies. Awesome, uh, we love those as well. Deborah said, keep going, you have plenty of viewers. I think I'm out of, I'm out of shrubs to talk about. I think I got them all. So um, I think I'm done. I've got lots and lots in store here, so come and check us out. Deborah. I hope you can come down from Richmond. I hope to see you soon. Um, and everybody else, we hope to see you soon. Uh, it's a great time to come in. It's gorgeous outside. I won't hold you up anymore. Get outside, work in the yard, come in, get some shrubs uh, if you need to, um, and check us out on Friday when I do my webinar on houseplants, some of the trendy houseplants. Uh, so everybody, have a great day. Great to see you. And we'll see you in the store hopefully soon. Have a great day. Enjoy the warm weather.